Are you listening? Because they are. Shh. It's Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com. I'm Amelia Dalton. And folks, this week we're diving into the deep, murky waters of IoT security. On the heels of that recent WikiLeaks document release, yes, you know the one, we've got a superstar in the field of IoT security to explain it all. Why we should be concerned about IoT security, what we can do about it, and if we should break out those tinfoil hats just yet. Or maybe that's for later. (laughs) Please welcome Alan Grau from Icon Labs. Hi, Alan. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks. It's good to be here. So first, give my audience a little bit of background of your position in the world of IoT and what Icon Labs is all about. Yeah. So Icon Labs is a software company focused on building security solutions for the IoT. We've actually been around for over 20 years building security solutions for embedded and M2M devices. And so we've taken that background and our expertise on how to build solutions for resource-constrained endpoints and use that to build out a series of products to allow OEMs to build highly secure IoT endpoint devices. Okay, Alan, let's dive into those recent WikiLeaks documents that were released that allege that the CIA developed or sought to develop or even borrowed cyber attack technology. So what do you think are the biggest challenges in this realm. I would imagine that legacy IoT devices play a big part here. No, that's definitely true. And and there's a couple of challenges. I mean, there's many challenges, but you know, two of the primary challenges are, as you pointed out, what do we do about all these legacy devices? There's you know, literally millions of devices that, you know, some of them aren't even really fitting into the classic or the current terminology of IoT. It's the legacy machine to machine or SCADA systems or other large industrial control systems. You know, there's so many connected devices out there. And for the devices that are already out there, we need to look seriously at what we can do to improve the security in those devices. And in many cases, there are some simple things that the users or operators of the devices can do, changing default passwords, making sure you have strong passwords, making sure that the devices are not exposed to the internet without additional security layers in between the device and the internet. I mean, right now there are literally thousands of SCADA devices with insecure protocols that are directly connected to the internet. So we need to make sure that we put a firewall in front of those devices and take other measures to protect those devices. The other half of it is, you know, what do we need to do to secure new devices? You know, the IoT is creating an explosion of new devices, and they're talking billions of devices as part of the IoT. And you know, by definition, if they're part of the Internet of Things, they're connected devices. And each one of those connection points creates an attack factor that could be exploited. So it's really critical to ensure that as new devices are being developed, as they're being designed, as they're being dreamed up, that security is included in the design from very early on. And so making sure that you're addressing all the basic security needs of the device, things like secure boot to ensure that the device is running your firmware, making sure you've got secure storage for your security keys, your encryption keys, so they cannot be easily tampered with or discovered. You know, so some of those very basic things need to be considered from early on in the design of the device. And then if the device is built in a secure fashion, then regardless of the attacker, it's going to be much more difficult for the attacker to exploit those vulnerabilities, to find vulnerabilities to exploit and compromise the devices. All right, Alan, let's look at the hard part, solutions. What kind of solutions do you think we need to look at as engineers to increase security in our IoT designs? Well, I think one of the first steps is just really looking hard at what the security needs are for the given device. So depending upon the type of device you're building, you can determine what the best approach is. If you're building a sensor that's going to live at the edge of the IoT network, collecting some data and sending it back to an IoT gateway or other IoT control device, that very small resource-limited device, you you may need to encrypt the data. You are going to want to make sure that you can guarantee the integrity of the data, but you probably aren't going to have robust protocols that are going to need the same level of security as an IoT gateway device. An IoT gateway device may have multiple functions, more protocols that it supports, And as a result, more complex operating system, and and as a result, more attack vectors. And then if you get into looking at some of the automated vehicle systems or things like an infotainment system in a vehicle, those are starting to become very complex systems that are supporting, in some cases, even things like a downloadable app store, where kind of like an iPhone or a DVR, there are 
third-party applications that could be loaded on it. And those may be from other companies as opposed to the huge range of applications available for something like a smartphone. But you're still downloading third-party applications. And so each of those requires a different set of technologies to ensure the security of the device. So that's really the first step is understanding what the specific problems that you're trying to face are and what the attacks are, what the consequences of those are. And then from there, you can start building out what sort of hardware security elements do you need in your device? You know, do you need a hardware security chip that can do some of the encryption offloading that can ensure protection of the keys? So you'd use something like a TPM or other hardware security element. If you've got something like an, a downloadable app store or third-party applications that can run on your device, then you're probably going to need to have something like ARM's Trust Zone or some other trusted execution environment, you know, the Intel TE environment, to provide segregation at the hardware level between the trusted applications and the kind of the general user applications. And then around that, you need all the software elements, which is what we provide for the software libraries to do code signing and code validation for secure boot and secure firmware updates, the intrusion detection and firewall software on the device so that if somebody starts trying to probe the device or tamper with the device, you can detect and report those events. So there's really a very broad range of capabilities that need to be looked at. Data protection is another piece. I mean, how do you, are you encrypting and storing sensitive data in an encrypted format so that if somebody gets a hold of the device, they can't just discover the secrets that are stored on it? So it's, it's really a, a pretty broad set of capabilities that need to be considered depending on what specifically the product is. So what do you think is the biggest takeaway from these release documents by WikiLeaks? Well, it's certainly one of the big takeaways is you know, we need to be more proactive in building security into these devices. You know, we can't really accept any longer the argument that essentially security by obscurity, that, you know, this is a fairly low-profile device. Nobody's going to bother to attack it because, I mean, these show that these devices have vulnerabilities and people are finding ways to exploit those vulnerabilities to control the device. So I think that's really the biggest takeaway is people need to be much more serious about building security into their connected devices. All right, Alan, it's time for your off-the-cuff question. Now, I know you enjoy some rock climbing outside of work. Um, What drew you to climb mountains, and what do you like about rock climbing in particular? Actually, living in Iowa, ironically, at one point I decided I wanted to climb a mountain and, you know, looked around and there was nothing close to a mountain in Iowa. Uh, But there is some pretty good rock climbing in the area, and so started that kind of as a way to train for, for doing mountain climbing. And Ended up doing one mountain in Colorado and decided that, you know, I really liked the short vertical cliff rock climbing as opposed to doing the big mountain and have stuck with that and and been doing that since. Excellent. Well, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me, Alan. All right. Thanks, Amelia. Folks, it's time for a little news you may have missed from late last week. Now, maybe you missed it because it just snuck by you in a flurry of regular old press releases. You know, XYZ power supply can now supply 4.8 volts instead of just 4. Uh, XYZ company has released a version of 4.84.38.742A of their automation software. <clears throat> Yeah. So for me, it was a pretty routine Friday morning. Got my coffee, scanning the news. And then I saw this press release with the title World Exclusive Revolutionary Low Current Design for New SOC Module. Now, there's a clue in the title. Current was spelled with an A instead of an E. But I'm going to have to admit that, yes, I missed that at first. After all, typos and press releases are pretty common these days, unfortunately. <clears throat> so this press release starts off pretty routine. Electronics design engineers Byte Snap Design unveils and reviews the latest microprocessor orientated at a new unique vertical market. This chip is about to send shockwaves through the electronics industry. We've seen the migration of electronics from gadgets used in home slash office to tech you can travel with and even wear. Recent years have seen increasingly widespread use of organic components in electronics such as OLEDs, batteries, and solar cells. The main drawback being the limit to the number of organic transistors that could fit on a chip until now. So you see what I'm saying? I'm hooked. Okay, so it continues. Byte Snap Designs say they have now discovered that by forming a suitable organic substrate into a form of a sponge, they can vastly increase the surface area on which to construct chip logic. Well, okay, tell me more. I think this is great stuff. And then it goes on to say, 
the transition from silicon wafers to sucrose wafers is a bold move. But the key ingredient is allowing it to be more palatable to many new consumers in 2017. So it was that word palatable. It struck a chord. Wait a second. And it goes on to say the part is based around a 26 centimeter. Note, uh, this should normally be millimeter. Uh, 36 pin QFN package. The dimensions are incredible and will be hard to swallow for some, but a reliable source tells us that the new 5 centimeter manufacturing process will be scaled down for production sucrose later in the year. Upon closer inspection, we detect that the low current, with an A, has been designed with IOT, icing on top, with the option for M2M marzipan to marzipan fillings. Okay, so the second time I saw that word current, that's current with an A, you know, the small berry fruit, not actually electrical current. Yes, it occurs to me that then I have been duped, gotten over on, um, April Fooled? Yes, this here press release was one of the best April Fool's jokes that have come around the bend here at EE Journal in quite some time. The following photos of the microprocessor in question were very obviously a cake, a layered cake of uh, like a tort of some sort. And yes, it does look like marzipan or maybe fondant in the area around the chip and the interconnects as well. With some very convincing silk screen identifier on top. So other than a very big, well played, well played, sirs, shout out to Bite Snap Design, which is actually a real company in the UK that specializes in embedded electronic design services and software development. This is a call out to all of my electronic marketers out there. Do more of this. EE can be fun. It can be entertaining as well. Well, outside EE Journal, that is, because we pride ourselves on being funny and entertaining and educational. We don't take ourselves too seriously. We poke fun. And if anything else, I will appreciate it. (laughs) All right, keeping up with our IoT theme this week, I have yet another exciting IoT development kit to throw your way. Okay, totally not going to actually throw it because that would be undoubtedly a very bad idea. Now, have you heard of the On Semiconductor WDK 1.0 GEVK wearable reference design and development kit? Well, you're about to. (laughs) One of the coolest aspects of this wearable kit is that it's compatible with air fuel wireless charging technology. So, need to charge your wearable? No cord, silly little circle thing needed, no problem. Just put it on the table and bam, charging. Okay, it's not really that easy, but it's pretty close. This kit includes hardware schematics, design files, and an integrated development environment with sample codes for developers and downloadable smart app, which is available from the Android Play Store and Apple Store for controlling multiple smartwatch functions. Sounds cool, doesn't it? Well... Don't just take my word for it. You can check out EE Journal's most recent episode of Chalk Talk entitled On Semiconductor Wearables Development Kit. In this episode of Chalk Talk, I sit down with AJL Jalad of On Semiconductor and chat all about this new development kit that will fast track your next wearable development project. And guess what? You can check out this episode of Chalk Talk by heading on over to YouTube, keyword EE Journal. You can also simply click the link below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com, or you can also check out the on-demand section of eejournal.com. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? 
Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash eejournal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at eejournaltfm. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, well, sure, you can follow us on LinkedIn as well. And we have that YouTube channel I mentioned earlier. Keyword, EE Journal. It is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, which also includes our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series. <laughs> and you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. By clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Fryin' page, you can also grab our Fish Fryin' RSS feed or subscribe to Fish Fry via the iTunes store. And remember, if you want any further information about the stories covered in today's show, just head on over to eejournal.com and look for this week's Fish Fryin' page. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology, any fun EE conference coming up that I absolutely should attend, or even the best geeky hotspot in your city, shoot me a line at amelia at eejournal.com or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of April 4th, 2017, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.